For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This whole Lenten season, pardon me, I'm trying to warm up my hands yet. (laughs) Sorry, I forgot to tell you that the heat didn't turn on in time. Uh, This whole Lenten season, we have been hearing about how Christ crucified is the center of our Christian preaching, but then what gifts that actually delivers to us. So we've come to learn of how the cross teaches us the mind of Christ, literally what God is thinking, what is his will for us. We've also come to learn how the cross um, is the wisdom of God. So it shows us not only knowledge, but how that knowledge is uh, put into practice, that God exercises the justice of his holy law on his son, Jesus Christ. We also came to learn of the knowledge of Christ, who he is, and what he has come to do for us. And tonight we learn how the cross is our redemption. To be redeemed is that word to be typically bought out of slavery. So for those who have been slaves, then to be redeemed is the purchase price has been given for your freedom. Of course, that begs the question then, what slavery Um, do we have in mind here? Of course, we might think of God's people of old in the Old Testament um, being slaves in Egypt and then again made slaves again by God in Babylon. This was God's doing, that they would come to recognize their sin and how sin makes one captive to not only to itself but to death and ultimately to the power of the devil. And without God's deliverance, We would remain yet slaves. Without his redemption, the redemption price paid, we would remain in slavery. Of course, then in Egypt, the redemption price was paid, and that was the blood of the Passover lamb. This coming up on the Passover of our God, the season of the resurrection, where the blood was poured out from the lamb and put upon the doorposts and on the lintel, and the angel of death passed over. So not only were the people then set free from slavery to that tyrant king, Pharaoh, and that kingdom of Egypt, but actually set free then also from the curse of death, the death of the firstborn. This, of course, is what we receive in Christ Jesus as as he sheds his blood from the cross, from the the piercings of the wounds in his hands, and in his feet, and in his side. That blood poured out upon us to forgive us poured out upon us in our baptism when we were washed in that blood, redeemed, poured out upon us, or for us, I should say, in the cup of blessing that we bless, the the cup of the supper. So we have been redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The text that's before us from Romans 3 is a beautiful confession of the righteousness of God being delivered to us sinners. But I suppose um, with the density of theological terms, that high church language uh, might be a little unintelligible to you. And it's worth our time to, uh, to walk through the text this evening so that you can better understand perhaps what Paul is saying. Most of this you might know, um, but it would be helpful to have working definitions of all those technical terms that he gave. So first, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. So the righteousness of God, to be right, of course, is to do the right thing, think the right thing, say the right thing. That righteousness is manifested, of course, then in Jesus Christ, who comes to do precisely what his Father has given him to do. That is, to be right, according to his Father and according to his will. The righteousness of God, then, is known in Jesus Christ. Not my will, but your will be done, he prayed. But that has to be manifested to us, that is, revealed to us. Actually, everything that Jesus came to say and that he said and that he did has to be revealed to us by the Scriptures. Otherwise, we would not know of it. We would actually, even if we came to learn of it, reject it but it has to be revealed unto faith so that we 
believe it. That means it cannot come by, uh, by works of the law. Now, you notice, um, if you're looking at the, the handout, that law has uh, two different meanings, and that's indicated there by the lowercase and the uppercase. You can disagree with the translator if you want, but um, law, broadly speaking, can be like the Word of God, especially the books of Moses. But when it's capitalized, that's the translator trying to indicate to you the highly technical word law, meaning the, uh, the word that brings judgment against you for your sin. All right? Most concisely, that would be um, the greatest command, you shall love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. More broadly, you could say it's the Ten Commandments then, right? All ten, I won't recite them now. Also, the prophets bear witness to this righteousness of God. It shows us what God expects of us, that we would live according to his holy word. We would do what he says, we would think how he thinks, and we would speak the way that he speaks. Both the law, narrowly speaking, or even broadly speaking, Moses, and the prophets, they all bear witness to it. They testify towards it, that there is a righteousness that's expected of us as God's people, as creation, actually, as creatures of God. But that righteousness is not ours, and it cannot come by way of the law, even though the law testifies to it. That being right before God, having the mind of Christ, having the words of Christ, even having the deeds of Christ, that has to be given to us as a gift. It has to come of God for us, through Jesus Christ, to us who believe. There's some argument about uh, verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith that is in Jesus Christ or faith that is of Jesus. Jesus was faithful to his Father's will. Uh, That in has been added. It should be italicized, I-N. So through faith, Jesus Christ is the literal. And so there's some argument. Of course, Jesus is the faithful one who faithfully does what the Father gave him to do. So that works. But also then we are called to have faith in response, which is worked in us by the Holy Spirit. So that we believe. We receive then the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ as a gift through faith. And why? Because there is no distinction. There is no one who is apart from, apart from the condemnation of the law. Or as he said in verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, as to that sin, of course, you know, there's broadly the category of original sin, the sinful nature, if you like. How that sin is manifested in our life is going to differ. How we transgress or violate the righteousness of God, how we go against his law, um, is unique to each of us. For some, it is um, greed and coveting. For others, it is lust, uh, the deceits of the eyes. For others, it is to actually just forsake God and his word. Um, And for others, it might be to dishonor uh, parents and other authorities. So it is that sin is manifest in us, coming from that sinful nature, and that is why all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Remember when uh, Jesus was asked, um, what must I do to be saved? He said, you must keep the law. You shall love the Lord your God, again, the greatest commandment. And not one jot or tittle, is how we usually translate it, not one slash or uh, period or dot above the eye. Every bit of the letter of the law must be kept if one is to be saved by one's own doing, by righteousness that comes from us. Well, of course, we fall short of that glory, as Paul says. And then he tells us that we are saved not by way of the law, but by way of, as we say, the gospel justified, made right with God by his grace as a gift. There's confusion here too. What does it mean to be justified but to be forgiven freely for Christ's sake? But what about his grace? What is it? What is grace? Again, a working definition would be helpful here. Um, and there's actually probably three opposing views of what grace is. We have some that say it's God's favor towards people, so he's gracious and kind, so he gives gifts to people. Um, That's kind of a broad definition of grace. There are those who say grace is the 
is the spark of God that he gives to people that then enables them to be more godly. That would be more of the Roman view, which we disagree with. But if you uh, survey the New Testament, grace is almost always connected to the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. So when we say by grace or by his grace, we mean by his gracious love to forgive sinners. That's what that means. That he would give not because of merit or worth, but freely out of his own character and out of his own disposition towards us as a loving God. And of course, as a gift, not by works, right? As we hear elsewhere in Romans. Meaning God does it all. That righteousness of, is of God. It's received through faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe by the work of the Spirit, again a gift, justified, made right with God freely out of his character, not of our character, and given to us freely as a gift. Meaning he does it all from start to finish. Through the redemption, that blood-bought um, Redemption from slavery that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Anybody have a working definition of propitiation? <laughs> yeah, that's a very technical term, isn't it? Um, I'll give you the Greek just to impress you. That's hilasterion. Um, it can be used of the, um, in the Greek Old Testament of the mercy seat. Remember the, the ark um, had a lid on top of it, and on that lid, then there were two um, angels, and it was said that God would sit upon that seat and dispense his mercy for his people. Of course, blood would be put upon that seat as well, the blood of the, of the lamb and of the scapegoat. So that was called the hilasterion, the propitiation place, if you like. Um, but Jesus here is actually our mercy seat then. It, he, it's his blood covering that covers for our sins. So if you want a working definition, propitiation is to be covered with blood for forgiveness. All right? So we are forgiven freely through, by his blood, which has been poured upon us by God the Father, freely through Jesus Christ. Again, to be received by faith. It should be noted here, he's noted already now twice, that it's through faith for all those who believe and to be received by faith. This is an important emphasis that we sometimes lose, lose sight of. It's not enough simply to speak of Christ and him crucified and how that's God's wisdom and his knowledge and um, his mercy and his grace. But it is necessary that it actually be received by you and for you. Not just simply out there to be, for you to go and find and to grab hold of, but rather as is the unanimous testimony of the New Testament, Jesus comes to you to forgive you, to speak the word of absolution into your ears. Most explicitly, of course, that absolution is proclaimed in the words of institution attached to the supper when he says, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So God put, putting forward Jesus Christ, that blood covering, actually blood for you to drink there, to be received by faith. For me is the emphasis there. That's what faith is, to say these gifts that Jesus talks about, these things that Jesus did, all the emphasis on the cross that we've been hearing throughout this Lenten season, that is for me and for all sinners. And of course, this is all to show, as Paul says, God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. What's most astounding about the gospel is that, that is the forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus, is that God is the one who is just and the justifier, as we say in verse 26. Meaning, his law is just. There is wrath against sin. Sin, going against God's word, deserves nothing but death and punish, eternal punishment. That is still true even today. And yet, God gave forward his own son for us to experience the death and the wrath for us in our place, so that he would be just. He fulfills the law for us. The law is true, and it is fulfilled. Our sins and the debt that they, pay, that they owe must be paid. But that debt is paid freely by God himself and his own Son, Jesus Christ, thereby justifying us, making us right. This is what 
uh, we like to call the blessed exchange. That Jesus takes our place um, in sin, becomes sinner for us, becomes the adulterer, the murderer, the thief, the coveter, the, the one who curses and swears, the one who forsakes God's word, the one who actually rejects God. He takes all of that sin into himself and becomes that for us, that we would be justified in him, that we would be and receive then as a free gift his righteousness, his perfect obedience, his obedience to his Father. So this is all to show God's righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The most astounding thing about this statement of faith from Paul, this confession of the truth of God's word, is that everything in it is about God and what he has done for us. So often the Christian truth gets confused when the emphasis is put on what we must do for God. Of course, that's the word of the law, and by works of the law, no, no person is justified before God. Instead, what Paul teaches us to do is to speak in the way of the gospel, is to always speak of what Christ has done for us and what the Father has done in putting forward his Son for us, what Jesus has done in being crucified for us to redeem us, indeed to redeem all who have sinned and fall short of the glory of God freely as his gift. For this we thank Jesus in his holy name. Amen. Amen.